not too long ago, I made a video where I talked about my top four reasons why I am excited about the science behind the vagus nerve. One of them obviously w was with the hope that some of the people who are suffering from long COVID might actually gain benefits from neuromodulation of the vagus nerve. But it's another point that was somewhat unusual that I mentioned, which was the fact that perhaps the vagus nerve could, could prevent Dr. Bosch's theory coming true. Now, what is this? Who is this person? I'll give you details. But basically, the take-home message is that the scientist predicts that the pandemic is yet to turn very pathogenic and very deadly. And I've been studying his material for a very long time, and I've been wanting to find anything I could find in order to basically be able to negate his prediction. Why? Because the consequences of his predictions are simply very dire. And basically, that's what we're going to talk about in this video. This video is first in what I hope is a series where I'm going to analyze supporting science for Dr. Bosch's theory that, the, that indeed we are evolving towards the situation where the pandemic is going to turn much more deadly as opposed to what it will be my new theory that, that that will not be the case. All right, my name is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Murray Genomics and let's get going. First, let's talk about Dr. Bosch and his theory. Now, Dr. Bosch is probably... Hmm, without much exaggeration, probably one of the greatest immunological minds of our time. And the reason why I say this is because he has come up with a theory that I affectionately call the everything theory. And the reason why is because honestly, his theory seems to have the capacity to answer any question you might have with regards to what has happened during the pandemic, why the events took place the way they did, as well as his theory, of course, has predictive value, meaning he also, he also can proclaims what he thinks will be, will be happening. Now, his theory is very complex super complicated, in fact. And by the way, I'm also taking his course right now, which is amazing. I highly recommend it if you're in the field of immunology or if you're a medical doctor. I say take the course. <laughs> the course is great because there's a bunch of, seems like immunology nerds that are, that are learning his material. And the best part of the course is that you can ask him questions, right? So really, really great stuff. Um, I can guarantee you, no matter what your level of knowledge in the field of immunology is, I'm pretty sure you'll be learning new nuggets of information. But besides that, besides the, that's besides the point. Basically, he proclaims that the virus will still evolve in order to become much more pathogenic. This is inescapable. And this in enhanced pathogenicity in combination with already achieved enhanced infectiousness of the virus will lead to horrific death amongst our population so much so this will be that they will this will be like a mass die off event of such say sometimes apocalyptic proportions the way he describes that in the past he even proclaimed that it might lead to immediate extinction of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Why? Because there will be such a massive lo loss of hosts due to, due to this increased pathogenicity. Now, obviously, this is very, very dark prediction, very scary. And I got to tell you, the way I study science, emerging science, I'm, I'm sad to say that the science I study seems to be supporting his theory like so the the way he explains his theory as i study the science mm, that there seems to be elements that i'm discovering that continue to support his theory nevertheless i've been wanting to find anything that might negate this theory and it's been very hard until i started studying the vagus nerve and that's where basically my hope erupted that maybe his theory will be wrong. And how did it all start for me? Now let's talk about my theory. Basically, it all started with the concept when I started looking into the science of um, how the spike protein could lead to the development of these abnormal clots in the blood. 
So this is in living individuals. So we're not talking about cadavers and what embalmers are discovering, which by the way, I've never found any scientific supporting evidence for that yet. And basically, one thing that I learned from those studies, and by the way, check out those series. It's a big, big series I've made. One thing I discovered is that different variants had different level of capacity to induce those abnormal clots. And Omicron basically was milder in its version than prior variants such as Delta. Now, the reason why this was also of interest to me and how this got triggered by the vagus nerve was because when I started looking into the science of the vagus nerve, by the way, I have a sponsor who basically pays me to study the science behind, publish science behind the vagus nerve and make videos on the topic, which is fantastic because I absolutely love it. I love the science behind the vagus nerve. I'm in love with the vagus nerve on top of it right now. I'm clearly brainwashing myself willfully, but I love it. I truly do. And one of the discoveries that I, that I came across was the fact that different variants based on computational modeling. So this is, we don't know if this is happening in reality. This is based on study in, on computers, right? It appears that different variants could interact with the acetylcholine receptors with, of the vagus nerve and Omicron doesn't seem to be able to interact as effectively as say the computational models suggest that Delta could. And this was my aha moment because, hey, I remember those clots that um, different variants induce different clots. And we do know vagus nerve is also involved in clotting. And this is perhaps where I thought, okay, maybe this is why we're seeing reduced pathogenicity. And this is why this dark doomsday scenario of en enhanced pathogenicity that will start killing off everyone not everyone, there's a specific group of people, but almost everyone, um, maybe it will not come true. So, and here's the funny part. So that that said, uh, I wanted to make a video on this. Here's the funny part. Dr. Bosch finally contacted me right before I was going to release a couple of videos. And, um, and I emailed him back. So we had a brief correspondence. It was great. I loved it. And um, why? Because obviously, you know, I get to tap into his knowledge, into his brains and as I mentioned, I think he's one of the greatest minds of our time when it comes to immunology. I've never seen anyone else connect so many complex dots in the field of science as this guy has. In, in any literature I have studied, and believe me, I study a lot. That's all I do. I just study published literature all the time. And I told them, hey, listen, I'm about to release a video that will attack you, you know, I will attack your theories. So he's like, okay, sure. Let me see what your theory is. Let's, let's, and let's discuss this. And we had a brief correspondence. So I'm going to tell you about, about what that correspondence was about. And the first video I released was actually in support of his theory. So I seemed like a good guy. And then boom, I released my video where I mentioned what I just told you. Now, I think overall, this was not received well by Dr. Bosch on two accounts. Number one, and this is, um, so I'm guessing here. Uh, number one is because my scientific evidence seems to be weak in order to attempt to um, say, negate his theory that he has developed over multiple years and uh, he has accumulated very large body of scientific um, studies in order to support his theory. So that's weak cells on my part um, in terms of just making some very nebulous uh, statements without much of a supporting evidence. So, and he's a hardcore scientist. So this is like, eh, 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 buddy, this is, this is, uh, that's not impressive. Okay. And the other one is because of course, in that video, I was, um, promoting the vagus nerve neuromodulation device. But hey, I obviously believe in, in, in the science behind it. And by the way, that just happened to be coincidence because the sponsor doesn't know anything about Dr. Bosch. But my excitement about the vagus nerve and the fact that it might negate his theory was very genuine. So I still believe that. So I'm still going to now attempt to provide in future videos evidence um, supporting this theory because I believe that this is one big gap in Dr. Bosch's theory. He does not involve nervous system at all. 
at all and anywhere in his theory and i believe that nervous system especially by vagus nerve does indeed play a big role in promoting promoting um, pathogenicity of the virus and we'll discuss this in the future videos this video is dedicated more to supporting evidence of dr bosch's theory this video series will be basically um, back and forth I'm planning to make multiple of these, basically discussing these two uh, opposing hypotheses. Because remember, this is only a hypothesis. He has a very good theory, but he's predicting future. And anytime you attempt to predict future, it's just a hypothesis. We will not know who is correct until time elapses. Although he claims, now he put a timestamp on it and he believes that um, his theory will come true very, very soon. Now we're talking about in mere months. So hmm, I guess I have nothing to lose because uh, and might as well, uh, you know, argue against him because if he's correct, then then many of us will be wiped, wiped out anyway. So I got nothing to lose the, this way. I'm also it's OK if I'm I feel I'm OK if I'm if I turn out to be completely incorrect about this, because ultimately I want to stick to believe that we're going to be fine. And and I'm okay uh, to be wrong if I'm arguing against one of the greatest minds of our time is what I believe. I really, really do admire him as a scientist. It's just, again, the way he can connect different scientific dots is incredible. I love it. It's, uh, it's awesome. And, um, and in the end, um, I'm going to be teaching the public about uh, his theory as well. So it's all good in my, in my mind. But then I released that video on the Vegas nerve and, and basically the correspondence ended there because this was not um, something that uh, he felt he, um, it was, uh, that he could support moving forward. But right before that video, we did have that exchange and I'm going to tell you about that right now. So in those emails, so I'm paraphrasing, but this is basically based on our, on our email correspondence. So... So this is as close as I can get from being able to speak on behalf of Dr. Bosch. And that doesn't mean I'm going to say it correctly. So please keep in mind that basically anything I can say could be, of course, slightly incorrect. I cannot say everything perfectly the way it was phrased back to me. Uh, but I will try to be as true to his words as possible. So multiple angles of why he didn't agree with, with my Vegas nerve theory so number one was let's so this was um, discussion about the changes to the spike protein and its effect number two was the vagus nerve itself and number three was omicron so we're gonna talk about these one by one so first let's talk about the spike protein changes and he mentioned look okay let's assume that i'm correct and and the spike protein changes remember spike protein is mutating all the time I should say virus is mutating and producing different spike proteins, different versions of spike protein as the pandemic goes on, right? It's evolving. Well, let's assume that indeed these changes that we are currently seeing in the Omicron era of the spike protein now prevent the spike protein from inducing those microclots and or interact with receptors other than the ACE2 receptor. ACE2 receptor is, of course, the one, one main receptor that spike protein is supposed to interact with in order to invade the cells that it wants to, the virus wants to infect. So let's assume that's correct. Well, he's saying that still does not answer other elements that we're seeing. So that simply hypothesis would not, would not um, account for what else we're seeing in this pandemic in the mRNA vaccinated individuals, which is number one their innate immunity is not being properly trained because of the mRNA vaccinations. And number two, their antibody response is now derailed due to the evolution of the virus. So that basically we, the antibodies that such individuals are producing no longer have the capacity to properly neutralize the virus. And if you have those two combinations come together, he's saying in in context of a virus that infects our cells and then and then destroys those cells in order to come outside that cell and then spread around when you have these events taking place lack of proper training of innate immunity and derailment of the antibody responses against that same pathogen 
then the outcome always has to be increased pathogenicity or, or increased virulence of the virus. So basically, that's like a rule basically in his book. So this cannot, the lack of interaction of the vagus nerve could not account for that which is bound to happen anyway. So that's number one. Now let's talk about the vagus nerve. This was the part that I found really interesting. And he's saying, first of all, he doesn't know of vagus nerve being inf infected productively, meaning there is no evidence that vagus nerve can be infected and then lead to further mm, progeny that could then burst out of that cell and infect other cells. It's other cell types that are being attacked in such way, not the vagus nerve. So that's number one. By the way, I made a video on the vagus nerve being infected. So what does that mean then? Does, does that mean that viruses, the progeny of that virus can then, can then extricate themselves, burst out of that vagus nerve. Obviously, vagus nerve being the biggest, longest nerve, it's not going to be destroyed by that, but are parts of it being destroyed? We'll be exploring that in a future videos. But another element he mentioned is also that as far as he understands SARS-CoV-2 virus, it can only spread extracellularly, meaning the virus has to, once it's inside the cell and gets replicated inside the cell, then the progeny that are produced as a consequence of that, they have to go outside that cell in order to go and, and spread further and infect other um, cells, other tissues, other organs. As opposed to moving from one cell to another, if two cells are, are side by side, as opposed to just literally flowing from one cell to another. Now, that one, I'm also not sure. I thought the vir this virus could do that, but I don't remember my reference. I'm going to leave that alone for, for, for now. But this is, and as a consequence, basically, he claims, look, he cannot see how a vagus nerve, which, which is a static, static um, cell that is in place, cannot move, cannot migrate, and it's stationary, how that could possibly compete with how the virus can be spread around the body, which is through attachment to certain type of immune cells, which are called dendritic cells. And this is where, this is big part of Dr. Bosch's theory, is that right now the reason why we don't see such large pathogenicity is because they, these immune cells do not move the virus from where we get first infected, which is our oral and nasal cavity, and down to our lungs. He calls this trans infection, trans meaning movement from one area to another. So movement from upper respiratory tract to the lower respiratory tract being your lungs, of course. And that's when your lungs get infected, that's where the problems begin. And we'll talk about that in a moment. So there is this option that exists for the, the virus versus vagus nerve that cannot cannot compete with that. It doesn't move. Well, this is where I'm going to disagree in my future videos in that no vagus nerve, which is indeed static, but it spreads to many different organs, including your lungs, could act as a conduit for spread of the virus. And we'll discuss that in the future. That's what I'm going to basically focus on in my theory, but I'm going to double down. And I'm going to double down and I'm going to mention further that I also don't agree with his final immunological outcome in that he believes right now the virus is basically evolving beyond our capacity to match what's happening. And as a consequence, what we're seeing, including IgG4 production and so on, that's basically a signature of virus evolving to the end result, which is this increased pathogenicity. And I'm going to say, no, that's the same symptoms that he thinks are a signature of the end result, which is the virus becoming more deadly, for me is actually a signature of how we can fight the virus and will prevent exactly from his theory coming true. I believe that we have certain evolutionary mechanisms built in that can be used under say extreme consequences that the purpose of which is to exactly prevent his outcome and that's what's at play the same signatures that he thinks is is showing us that we are about to see more pathogenic state of the virus 
I will claim no, it's the same signatures that show that we will not see that. And versus he claims we will see a massive death waves. I don't think so at all. I don't think we'll ever see a mass death wave. I think we're going to see perhaps some increase in deaths of individuals like what we're seeing right now but the outcome of that is actually overall population protection and i'm going to get into that in future videos as as well i'm gonna leave that alone but basically that's where where we will differ is on the vagus nerve so that was his second comment and final on omicron he was saying listen i mentioned in that video that omicron I, i'm jump species and as a consequence the way Omicron evolved was very different in a different environment than our than what is our own human biology, and there might not be a way going back. Now he he doesn't agree with that. He thinks that uh, Omicron did not ever have to jump species, and the complexity of evolution allowed the virus to to achieve enormous changes right inside the human host, so that Omicron was simply evolved in a human host. And um, you know what? Very, that could very likely be true because indeed we have seen other variants in the family of Omicrons that have spectacular changes among amongst them. That is just like wow! Just like when Omicron first came out on a scene and led the immune escape, which is what Dr. Bosch was, as far as I know, was the first one to predict that we will see immune escape. Where meaning basically there will be a variant that eventually the virus the vac vaccines will not be able to stop and that's exactly what happened with the omicron right and so ba basically that same event might have just happened with omicron we will discuss omicron in another video on this series and i've got to tell you this is a crazy story supporting dr bosch's claims as well but very very wacky story so stay stay tuned for that all right so that's basically how that's about the email correspondence and the last thing that uh, based on my theory and how I responded to my theory but the last thing he did he also provided me some scientific evidence to support his own theory which was my favorite part because well that's basically what we need to do we need to look at science and it was really good stuff very interesting this is one of the reasons why or I mean this is I, this is the main reason why in this video is dedicated to to supporting his theory and i'm counting this as a point for dr bosch in this in this uh, <laughs> fight against two two different theories of what might happen in the future so and what so what are we talking about he sent me a paper about a variant mm, and how pathogenic that variant is this variant was called ba286 this is a parent of the jn1 variant which which basically took over the world recently and until recently it was basically the major variant in north america it's still the major major variant but basically it's there's a new kid on the block that is finally starting to put a dent or dent <laughs> in in uh, how much jn1 we are seeing currently in north america as well it's one of the babies of jn1 itself but basically at the time, he provided evidence for 2BA286, which is an ancestor of JN1. And what did that paper discuss? So did that paper discuss the concept that that variant showed enhanced fusogenicity? So we need to discuss this. What is fusogenicity? Fusogenicity is basically the capacity of the virus to fuse with the cell with cells that it wants to infect and we can when that happens remember of course spike protein is produced inside cells and then when spike proteins are produced on top of the cell the cells with the spike proteins on top of that on top of them they can fuse with other adjacent cells why because the primary role of spike protein is to achieve that fusion of the virus with a cell because the spike protein a lot of people don't think it's just to bind a receptor on our surface of the cell no once you interact with the receptor check out my past video on this once you bind the receptor spike protein head is ripped off and you have and the spike protein has this extendable arms and these extendable arms can literally go reach out and grab adjacent cell and pull that cell towards the virus so that the virus can fuse with the cell well if you have spike protein on a on a cell surface and that spike protein is normal 
that spike protein can then reach out from one cell surface to another cell, grab that cell, bring that cell towards, towards, its, towards the cell that is grabbing the other cell, and the two cells will fuse. Now, the, per, the, when you have this fusion of these cells, that's called syncytia formation. So syncytia, it's a weird word, basically means fusion of, of, of two or more cells together. And then you basically become, the, you can create these very unusual, big globular, globular cells with multiple nuclei inside, not normal. And that has been seen in severe COVID and it's actually a hallmark of pathogenicity of the virus. So we've seen that the most with Delta, even the very original virus, this, the one that started the pandemic, even that guy had very high fusogenicity capacity. Then Delta was the worst. And ever since Omicron came on board, that fusogenicity has dropped a lot. Okay, so we're going to talk about how that has increased. And by the way, just so you know, vaccinal spike protein cannot do this. It was specifically mutated so that these arms of the spike protein cannot extend. So the spike protein from vaccines, those arms cannot extend. And that means if you take the vaccine and express the spike protein on the surface of the cells, that spike protein cannot force fusion of cells from one another, just so you know. Oh, and by the way, I should also mention that what does Dr. Bosch suggest that if his theory is correct, you should do to protect yourself? Well, antivirus is your only way. That's basically the only thing that he talks about. And if you're wondering which antiviral, antivirals, well, mm, the ones that we were, we're all basically saying, you sh none of you should take it, y'all. <laughs> if you know what I mean, I made a video on that topic from my Patreon account as well. I also made a video on uh, other ways of how you could protect yourself if Dr. Bosch's theory is correct as well. So check those out. But anyway, the paper he provided, the variant 2BA286, it showed increased fusogenicity. And you can measure this in this ingenious way where basically you take a cell, you put the spike protein in that cell. So the spike protein is on a, on a surface and that cell will also have what is referred to as green fluorescence protein, meaning you can, you can track it under a microscope because the cell literally will fluoresce green, okay? And then you juxtapose those cells with same type of cell, but cells that have now ACE2 receptor on its surface. So now the spike protein on one cell can interact with ACE2 on the surface of another cell and because of that, these two cells will fuse and you can monitor that because you have that green fluorescence under microscopy. So in this paper basically showed specifically that BA286 variant, which is the, which was not long ago, a, a, a variant that eventually led to JN1, which is the big one right now, that variant mm, does lead to certain level of increase syncytia formation so you can see these images with with green cells and you can basically measure their size and you can measure how much syncytia is being formed and the authors did it in two different cell lines one of them was um, embryonic kidney cells called 29 uh, hec uh, i believe 293t or t293 and that variant ba286 huh, it was weak sauce it didn't do as well as maybe some of the previous Omicron variants, such as XBB1.5. But when they used lung cell lines called Kalu3, BA286 variant actually showed impressive syncytia formation, meaning that variant was actually fusing lung cells. Not bad. Equivalent to maybe some of some of the better Omicron variants. So that seems to be supporting Dr. Bosch's theory because remember, according to his theory, the real problems will begin when virus has again the capacity to descend to our lungs. And right now, this migration on the surface of, of certain immune cells down to our lungs is being prevented. And that that's where the the evolution will take place this this will stop and that's where we'll have this pathogenicity and he claim claims that that evolution is taking place right now now that's not jn1 and i can tell you that um just um recently a paper
came out that did indeed look at JN1. And unfortunately, they didn't, they didn't do Delta. Um, there was one paper that did look at um, these same sail lines as well, and they compared Delta. So maybe let's talk about that because you can see that how Delta was by far the worst when it came to formation of that syncytia, where from that fusogenicity between different cells that had spike protein on their cell surface and, and hence how you can increase pathogenicity. This is one of the reasons why Delta was so problematic at the time when the Delta took over the world. So now let's look at the last paper, the one that just recently came out that actually investigated JN1. So that's something that I've researched just to compare. And in that paper, again, they looked at similar cell lines. So that's great because now we can compare them all together. And JN1 actually did little, even a little bit better than BA286 variant, the one that, the one that Dr. Bosch sent me science articles to support his theory. So JN, JN1 did even better, just a little bit, but even better. So it supports this theory that maybe this pathogenicity is indeed increasing. By the way, JN1 is only different from BA286 by single mutation in a receptor binding domain, which is the tip of the spike protein that is involved in interaction with the ACE2 receptor. But the paper also introduced another variant, which right now, is just a smidget in the world. And I believe it was called BA2761. And that one is just emerging. I think it, it was first maybe noticed in South Africa. And in right now, when I just checked the information from CDC, it's, it's not observed in, in, uh, in North America, but that one has even greater capacity of fusogenicity or formation of that syncytia so that the, the, that syncytia formation is even greater. So once again, now we have a, a variant that is starting to look like some of the older Omicron variants that were more pathogenic. So, so indeed, this supports the concept that maybe we are seeing this increased pathogenicity, just like Dr. Bosch is claiming. Okay. All right. So that's going to wrap it up. My response of Dr. Bosch to my hypothesis. And mm, right now, this is a score for Dr. Bosch. But in the future videos, I will obviously argue my case. In the next video, I will still argue Dr. Bosch's case with regards to Omicron. And the reason why is because it's just such, an, <laughs> such a weird but interesting story when it comes to Omicron. So stay tuned. And then we're, then um, I need to start studying a little bit more and I will start attempting making my own case. And, um, and hopefully I'm not going to disappear before that because as I mentioned, Dr. Bosch thinks that this disastrous event of virus becoming more pathogenic is literally going to happen very soon very soon by summertime he thinks it's gonna be upon us and of course again i'm saying nope i think he's going to be wrong and uh, and um whew. <laughs> and the reason why uh, why is because i think the we're activating very different immunological response than what he thinks is happening and and we are only see steady rise of deaths and that steady rise of deaths, I believe, is there to protect the population because that's the individual price that some individuals might pay in order to protect the population. So in some capacity, it's like maybe moving towards herd immunity. So stay tuned. We'll make future content. In the meantime, please share. Please uh, subscribe if you haven't already. Please leave us a comment. Please uh Hit that like button. All of these is obviously helping us grow. And um, I look forward to seeing you in a future installment. And remember, spend as much time outdoors getting a vitamin D as possible. Bye, everyone.